be on stage because during our events we're usually running in the back and we have our speakers on stage, but you see a lot of us today, so bear with us. Um, just to talk a little more a little bit today. So Board of the Summit is not um, just a one-day conference. So it's much more, it's an extension of our two-week acceleration program. Our class um, that some of you already met today arrived last week. They've been living together under the same roof, going through a pretty packed schedule every day, meeting our thought leaders, talking about growth, talking about hiring, talking about legal immigration, fundraising, um, talking about um, unfortunate political climate. We're going to be talking about cross-border collaboration, cross-border investment, sharing amazing entrepreneurial stories with you today. So there's a lot of exciting things coming up. And now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker. I'm sure you all heard of him. Maybe some of you know him. Um, it's Justin Khan. He is the CEO and founder of Atrium. Uh, in general, he's a serial entrepreneur and angel investor, uh, best known for co-founding Twitch. And more recently, he founded Atrium, which is a law firm for startups. And today, Justin's going to talk about how international entrepreneurs can set themselves for investment from U.S. investors. So let's give a round of applause to Justin and start our day. All right, what's up, Founders Embassy? <coughs> Sorry. How are you guys doing this morning? Great. Great, one great. There's one person who's great and like 90 people who are okay. All right. Let's see if we can get this there. All right, here's my presentation. I'm going to talk to you about international entrepreneurs and how they can set themselves up to raise money from U.S. investors. That's a very common question that we would get at YC. Uh, because as the classes grew, more and more of our YC batches became international founders. I think it's up to maybe 35 or 40 percent now. Uh, and so, you know, that was a, that was a common uh, question. How do they set themselves up? Uh, before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and maybe why you should listen to me. Started a lot of companies starting about 13 years ago here in Silicon Valley. Uh, the one that actually worked well was called Twitch. There were a lot of ones that didn't work so well. Uh, put the logos up there for your, um, at the top. And then I invested in a lot of companies, uh, some of which worked really well, uh, and some of which didn't work so well. And as I was assembling this slide, I realized a lot of those companies were actually international companies. Uh, a lot of them, um, uh, like Scotty, Automile, Paystack, Razorpay, Zendit, Sandberg, Bellaby, all started off as companies in uh, another country and either moved here or ended up incorporating here uh, in order to raise capital. Uh, they often would come here to get access to the Silicon Valley culture, which I'm sure a lot of you guys uh, have come here for today. And they also came here to get access to Silicon Valley capital. And so, um, you know, over the years I've seen a lot of things. I've seen like what works. I've seen a lot of things that don't work. Uh, I've done a lot of things that don't work. I've done a few things that work. And I would like to share them with you. All right, so the first step, I think, is to ask yourself why you even want to raise money from U.S. investors or come here at all. Uh, and the number one answer is often access to capital for international investors, or sorry, international founders. Uh, one of the top complaints is there are no investors in you know, my home country of X or my home market of X. And I think that's changing a little bit now, uh, especially you know, in, in certain markets like China, maybe a little bit in Southeast Asia. Uh, but largely, uh, it's true that there are just more investors, both on the angel side and the venture side in Silicon Valley than anywhere else in the entire world. So oftentimes we see founders come here because they want access to those investors. Uh, the second reason is they want access to the knowledge of how to help you build your, or how, how to help them build their company. So, uh, you know, Silicon Valley is, 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 is home to many giant internet companies. Obviously, you know, the Facebooks and Googles of the world, and it also has created this massive secondary ecosystem of uh, people who have scaled before. You know, they've scaled the technical side, they've scaled the operation side, and oftentimes that knowledge isn't as readily available in uh, the rest of the world. And so coming here and uh, talking to experts who have done it before, uh, learning from them, maybe getting them on your side, invest in your company, uh, is a great way to accelerate your process. And lastly, 
I think there's more willingness uh, on the part of both investors and participants in the ecosystem, so people have done it before, employees, uh, founders, to work with and back uh, and participate in uh, international companies. You know, I think I joined the, my, the board of, uh, of one of my international investments for the first time ever last year. And um, you know, I, it's just because there's uh, more and more opportunity as the rest of the world, as mobile has kind of grown in the rest of the world, and, uh, there's more people buying goods and services online. The opportunity uh, has shifted from more people thinking the U.S. is kind of the entire world in terms of market to uh, the outside uh, world being very interesting from an investment perspective. And uh, you know, greedy U.S. investors like myself want to participate in that as well. Uh, so you know, it's a timing thing. Uh, now is a good time, as good of a time as ever, to get the participation of uh, U.S. investors and entrepreneurs in your international startup. All right, so if you want to take this path, what's, what is the way to do it? Uh, the first thing is uh, something that YC didn't require at first, but then started requiring a couple years ago, uh, was that every international company flip to a US company. And so what's a flip? What does that mean? It's when you create a Delaware C corporation and exchange shares with your, um, uh, with your foreign entity. So effectively, you have a US entity that's investable um, by uh, investors in the U.S. and globally. And the reason that's important is actually a lot of uh, funds and a lot of investors uh, don't want to invest in an international company. And the reason for that is there's these like additional horrible tax reporting requirements. Oftentimes it's written to, into their uh, LP, limited partner agreement. And so uh, it's really important. It sounds like a small thing and it's actually, it's kind of bad for you in certain ways. It's a, it's a bad tax burden. Uh, but it's, uh, it's something that's pretty necessary uh, if you want to get investment from, uh, from U.S. investors. Uh, and it's something we definitely recommend. Um, some of the companies that I invested in, in fact, all of the companies I invested in uh, have, have done that. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of things to consider. I'm not going to go into them today. Uh, we started this company, Atrium, uh, a year ago, actually, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, to help innovate in the legal space and make legal uh, much more easy for founders and entrepreneurs. And we work with a lot of international founders as well. So we have a bunch of experts who can help you with that. But um, the things to consider are uh, the tax implications, you know, IP, like who, which entity owns the IP, and how you structure commercial agreements between these two entities. Uh, but I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to tell you about those things. And plus, it's a little too boring for a stage presentation. All right. Last thing I'll say is you should do it now. If you want to do it, the, the complexity of flipping your organization only grows over time. As your organization grows, your number of employees grow, you know, figure out how to get them equity in the U.S. entity so that upon an exit, you will be, they'll be able to um, participate in that. It uh, becomes more and more complicated as your headcount grows and your business grows. So my recommendation is to do it uh, as soon as possible. And you will save yourself legal fees but you will also save yourself a tremendous amount of pain, which I think is uh, my, my non-international related recommendation as a founder is, you know, strike and reduce your own pain. All right, so after you've done that, what do you need to do? First thing is build this icon, rocket ship. You need to figure out, I mean, everyone always wants to figure out what the hack is to raise money. Uh, but the real hack is to build something that has product market fit and is actually working and growing really well. Um, so I, I think that's, I would spend 95% of your effort on, instead of like trying to figure out what the fundraising hack is, to spend the 95% of your effort on talking to your customers, figuring out what they want, how to make what they want, delivering it to them and getting feedback. And if you do that, hopefully you will iterate into something uh, that eventually grows really well. Um, there we go, achieve product market fit. If, you know, that's what we did to create Twitch. Uh, we did not come up with a great idea about around uh, allowing people to stream video games uh, to, you know, this apparently a massive market of over 100 million people every month. Uh, to discover Twitch, we started off with this really horrible idea, which was that I was gonna create a live video show about myself, kind of like Big Brother, and we started broadcasting it to the internet, and people came to it expecting entertainment, and they found you know, for you know, pro internet programmers sitting on their computers programming. <laughs> it's a horrible show. 
Uh, and eventually they, they asked us, you know, they were like, we want to create our own live stream, so we created this live streaming site for anything. Uh, so we kept talking to our customers over the next couple of years, and we discovered one of the things that they wanted was to stream their own video game gameplay. Started working on that, and just talking to our customers, figuring out what they wanted. They wanted to get paid. We created a partner program for them to get make, to make money. Uh, and you know, after years and years of iterating, like eight years of iterating, uh, we finally grew it to this pretty big website. Um, it's actually now number 12 in the United States. It's pretty awesome. And uh, in 2014, we ended up selling to Amazon for $970 million. So there really is a way to iterate and talk to your customers uh, to achieve success. And I really think that's what you should spend most of your time uh, doing. Second thing uh, that's really important, especially for international founders, is you want to be attacking a huge market. Um, if you're not attacking a huge market, it is extra. Or um, if, if, if investors don't perceive you to be attacking a huge market, it's extra hard to raise capital. Uh, it's also extra hard to you know, kind of actually build a big business. That was a problem that we ran into at Twitch, right? People thought this watching people play video games market was extremely small. And it felt like it was small because of their own impressions. Uh, in fact, despite the actual eventual size of the market, right? So it turns out it, turned, it was a big market, but it was really difficult for us to raise capital uh, because it wasn't perceived as small. Uh, for international founders, I think it's really important that you be attacking a large market um, and really be thinking about how you present that market as large because, um, well, oftentimes, you know, because of the, the, I guess, U.S. centrism, you know, people here think, like, the U.S. is everything and, you know, whatever, and, you know, whatever country that you're attacking isn't, like, a big enough market, so you want to take pains to make sure that you are attacking a big one. And oftentimes that means aggregating an entire region or attacking uh, verticals that people know are going to be big, like transportation or food delivery. All right, what's next? So uh, I always talk about fundraising as um, starting with narrative. So once you have, let's say you've done the 95% of the work and you have uh, figured out a great way to, uh, you know, uh, achieve our product market fit, your company's growing, uh, the next, and you want to raise capital, right? What's the next step? The next step is figuring out a narrative, and a narrative uh, has three parts. Uh, every narrative in human history has three parts. It is, you know, the world is a certain way, and then something happens, and then the world's now a different way. So how does that apply? I know that sounds super simple, but how does that apply to fundraising or to your company? Uh, I think you always want to think about structuring your narrative and your conversations with investors as going through these uh, three acts. You know, in the first act, you're telling them about um, you know, the product, the market, like where the market is at, where the problem is, why it's a big problem. Uh, and then there's some inflection that happens, something changes. You know, maybe it's now everybody has a mobile phone, maybe it's now everyone has a credit card, maybe it's now there's lots, you know, everyone wants to buy something online, uh, and buy things online. And so then you uh, go into what's changed, right? So something has changed about the market. Um, maybe it's your insight, um, maybe it's your, uh, you, you're in the right place at the right time even. And then, Lastly, the, the third act is the world's now a, a new way. What does that mean? Uh, it's like the, that's the example of you know, what your product is, how it solves a problem, what your traction is, the evidence that you are that you're going to reshape uh, the world. And I think it's really important to have a, a very practiced and rehearsed narrative that kind of walks people through a story arc where at the end of it, they end up believing that you are going to be something really big. Um, and so I encourage people to like just practice, 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 iterate, try different things until you find that narrative that really resonates with people. You don't have to practice just on investors, you can practice on your fellow entrepreneurs, other people in the industry, uh, and you'll start, uh, you know, you'll start understanding that your narrative is working when they are getting excited about it. Okay, so step four, another thing that people always ask is like how do we determine our valuation? Well, Valuation in early stage companies is completely made up. Uh, it's completely not disconnected from your revenues. Uh, it's really much more tied to your potential. So stop trying to worry about you know uh, calculating based on the thousands of dollars of revenue a month you're making and start uh, figuring out how to pitch that giant narrative because that's what's really going to drive valuation for you. Um, and then think about raising enough money that you can last you know, 18 to 24 months to achieve some set of milestones that are compelling and give yourself a buffer. There's a lot of, lots on, on online about this, so um, I definitely recommend uh, reading up.
But the really important part is a lot of times people get trapped in this thought of like, uh, my valuation has to be dependent on some financial metrics and in early stage technology companies that is very much not the case, <coughs> luckily for all of us. All right, so now that you uh, have a plan, you have a narrative, you want to figure out what investors you want to go pitch. Uh, and the first part is I think that you should save your time and save your potential investors time by really isolating and um, zeroing in on the investors who are most likely to be interested in your business. So um, there's a lot of investors who, you know, if that means if you're, like if you're a biotech company, you want to raise money for people who have invested in biotech companies. Uh, if you're an international company, you probably want to figure out people who are actually even open to investing in um, international companies. So I would do a lot of research. Um, you can do research, like look, up, look at what people have invested in on Crunchbase on, um, or on AngelList and figure out uh, who are, like make a list, just make a, a Google Sheet or, a, or Excel on who uh, you want to potentially get intros to. Um, and then you want to target the people, um, the right people to give you that introduction. Um, so it's really hard, and my last bullet point here is it's super hard to cold email people. You know, I get like actually probably half a dozen cold emails from people who want money every day. Uh, that's too many people to give my money to. Um, unfortunately, uh, and so it's really important to uh, get a good intro. Uh, luckily, it's actually not that hard. Uh, there's lots of people here who can probably help you. Your batchmates at Founders Embassy, other entrepreneurs, people who raised money from those investors before. You know, just do this systematically. Make your spreadsheet. Figure out who could you, who you know, maybe one of your existing investors uh, can introduce you to some investors and um, and kind of like you know just line them all up and then ask those people for an intro. Uh, in that intro, you want to you want to create a short, concise summary of why you're a compelling investment. Probably runs through, you know, in like seven to eight sentences those three narrative arcs uh, very quickly, um, and that's really important. All right. Then once you get these intros, what do you do? Go and prepare to these meetings. First thing is I would avoid all assumptions. You should um, not assume that people know about your industry. You want to be able to explain. Um, your business and your industry like you are explaining to somebody who doesn't know anything and is um, you know, a reasonably smart person who has no context. Uh, and so that means making it really concise, making it simple, walking them, uh, you know, don't, not using like industry acronyms or, or anything like that. Um, it's really important because like basically any chance that someone has to check out of a conversation, they're going to do it. Uh, you know, they're going to go look at their phone or, or um, be distracted, think about their actual problems in their life. Uh, you need to keep them engaged. And so do that by, you know, running them through this powerful narrative and keeping it super simple. Um, you want to know what you're doing in this first meeting, you know, based on the type of investor uh, you're talking to. For angel investors, they may be ready to write a check uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, for venture investors, they're probably going to ask you to follow this process, uh, where if they're interested, they're going to move you along to a meeting with multiple partners and then from there meeting with maybe other partners and then from there maybe a, a full partner meeting. Uh, so do your research first, figure out who you're talking to. Um, I, I like to put this one in there, you wanna be really honest and upfront. I think um, being authentic is a really powerful uh, motivator for people, you know, for connecting with people. And uh, you know, you wanna be honest about the things that are really compelling and good about your business. Hopefully you believe in it. Um, and you also wanna be upfront about the things you don't know. Uh, it's really bad to just make, make up an answer. If you, they ask you a question that you don't know the answer to, uh, it's really bad to just make up an, an answer you think people can tell uh, that you're bullshitting them. And so it's important to be very authentic and honest. And uh, I don't know is an okay answer. Um, it's better though if you really know your numbers and know all the metrics of your business. So you should take pains to make sure you do them. And the bonus is that you'll actually probably run your business better if you do. Lastly, you know, you should think about what your unique selling point is. Hopefully that's woven through the thread of your narrative, uh, really understanding uh, what's the most compelling few facts about your business and uh, making sure that you hit on all of those is incredibly important. Okay, so once you've had this great conversation, they were asking you questions, they were super engaged, what happens next? Uh, I think you want to make sure you're directing your ask and um, make sure to you know say, hey, you know, we're raising our seed round. Are you interested? Or you know, uh, what's the next step? Trying to figure out how to move the conversation along to them actually investing. Um, oftentimes, then they'll be like, oh, well, what are your terms or whatever? And then just yeah, you want to kind of 
push the conversation along without being too pushy. Um, I think it's really good to have a time frame for in your <coughs> fundraising. It's not to say that you should just say, oh, I'm closing at this date. Because usually if you don't have any leverage, that's, you know, people will detect that's bullshit. Uh, but it's good to say, you know, I'm um, spending the next two weeks talking to investors and then our goal is to close our seat round, right? Um, the last thing is, this is something we had at YC, a handshake protocol. Uh, if you agree on something, um, terms, and then you email each other and then that agreement and shake on it, uh, then you should stick to it instead of, you know, finding out, oh, I can get a better deal from another investor like the next day, and then kind of going back on uh, your agreement. Silicon Valley is based on trust. It's based on the trust of investors doing what they say uh, when they uh, agree to fund companies and vice versa. And I think that's uh, really important for your uh, reputation. <laughs> Final notes. All right. Fundraising is a tool to build your business. Uh, it's not the end game. Raising a lot of money sounds super fun and attractive. Maybe the process doesn't sound fun, but having it might sound fun. Uh, but really, it's just a tool to build your business. And you should raise that capital when you are constrained uh, by cash in building your business. And if you're not constrained in, in, uh, in, term, in terms of resources, you should probably just continue building your business uh, uh, independently and not worry about fundraising. And oftentimes, you know, we'd see this at YC. I've been caught up in it myself, uh, in getting it, and caught up in this fundraising beauty contest where you're trying to get the highest valuation of the most money. Uh, inevitably, that is never the thing that uh, makes a difference at the end of the day uh, with your company. Startups are, um, Paul Graham used to tell me, startups are a uh, pass fail uh, course. And so, you know, really, if you, you're just trying to get enough, um, or you're trying to build your business, and, and if you, you know, IPO or M&A, that's, that's <coughs> and it really doesn't matter that much. Um, you know, optimizing for valuation along the way doesn't really matter uh, that much to be focused more on getting to the pass. Um, <coughs> lastly, I think it's, it's especially relevant for you if you are raising money in a Series A and you're going to have someone join your board, uh, but you want to find somebody who is a, going to be a long-term good partner for you. You know, if they're joining your board, uh, you're going to have to see them. They're like the empl only employee you can't fire. Uh, and so you better get somebody that you actually want to hear from, that you actually like, you want their opinion on. Uh, you don't want to get someone who annoys you. Um, that's not fun. Uh, so, so really focus on getting that long-term partner. In a seed round, maybe that's a little less important, um, but uh, because they're not, you know, they don't have any direct control or maybe get raising money from you know, 10 or 20 people. Um, but really finding investors who are helpful to you is something that I would focus on. Uh, because you know maybe only 25% of investors end up being helpful. The other 75% might say they're helpful, but um, actually might not be helpful or might actively be harmful, and you want to avoid those people. Uh, you can do reference checks, which is a great way to uh, find out more. All right. Lastly, how I can help further start this company called Atrium. We help founders with legal. Uh, so you know, if you do have questions, uh, you can send us a note. Uh, it's atrium.co. Uh, we also run this boot camp called Atrium Scale, which is a free boot camp for founders who want to raise money. And uh, we do that because it's really good lead gen for our law firm, sort of. Um, but it's also something I like doing. And so uh, it's like a two-day boot camp that we do every couple months in Silicon Valley. And you can apply online. And lastly, we created this blog uh, where we kind of give our best fundraising tips and knowledge uh, on atrium.co slash blog to learn more about any of these topics that I just touched on. And that is it. All right.